the inspiration for this, this research that I've been doing for uh, a little over a year and this presentation came from my uh, experience when I was growing up um, in the Dallas area and I go to jam sessions and sit in with older uh, musicians and my mentors and um, you know I'd practice all week on, on one of the tunes that I wanted to play and I'd show up and they said, okay, what do you want to play, Christian? And I'd say, let's play uh, There Will Never Be Another You. And in inevitably, they would say, what key? Like, you can play more than one key, I don't want to do this one key. And <clears throat> younger musicians can't really do that so much today. We learn a tune in a certain key, and we think very uh, streamlined. We know in one key, it's difficult to go away from that. So, the idea of this lecture is a systematic method for learning standards by ear, thinking functionally, just like we do in classical music. Uh, you know, you have <clears throat> tons of classes and study and form and analysis where you think about, you analyze things with Roman numerals uh, as opposed to thinking this is specifically in one key or another. And my, my idea is that older musicians that learn music before there were fake books, they learned it by ear and thought of it functionally rather than just within one key at a time. Um, so the, the idea behind this lecture is um, to think about certain things step by step, how you can start to think of tunes that way. And by following these steps, not only will you be able to play tunes in more keys than one, um, but it will also increase your ability to learn tunes and develop a repertoire. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's important here. So when I, this lecture is based on standards in the sense of the, the Great American Songbook. Um, songs that came from musical theater um, from the 20s and 30s. George Gershwin, Cole Porter, Jerome Kern, Irving Berlin, people like this. Um, and why, why are those tunes important? Well, it's because that was the foundation of the, the bebop players like Charlie Parker and um, Thelonious Monk, all those guys. They learned these tunes and then they, they advanced uh, the harmonic uh, conception based on those tunes. And everything sort of came from those tunes in modern jazz. Uh, so that's the foundation. Ideally, this lecture would turn into an entire term course, and then the second term would be the bebop superimpositions over these standard tunes, and the third term would be uh, modern harmonies and seeing the, the linear evolution of that. But this is the this is like day one. This is geared towards um, ideally college freshmen coming in that want to into a jazz program. Um, so why is it important to have tunes learned by ear other than reading out of a fake book? Um, so uh, something is missing here, but uh, there's cognitive areas of the brain that are occupied when reading a tune. When you've got a fake book in front of you, you're reading the, the chords and you're thinking, okay, this chord is coming up, okay, okay. But if you free that up and it's all in here and you can hear the changes, then it uh, frees up all those areas to be utilized and uh, doing a creative improvisation, improvisational narrative. Um, uh, a large repertoire allows the musician to take part in jam sessions. Uh, the skills developed in an hour of performing are equivalent to 10 hours in the practice room. Um, that's a quote by David Baker. So anytime you get a chance to perform, uh, it's worth a lot more than time in the practice room. You learn a lot more intuitively. Um, <clears throat> and the pioneers of jazz learn tunes by ear, like we were saying, they listen to recordings to learn songs. Um, <clears throat> interaction with an increasing number of musicians in jam sessions provide aspiring artists with stimulus for their own growth as improvisers. Uh, Paul Berliner, Berliner said this in that uh, just hearing other people's approach to improvisation and jam sessions can broaden your own approach. <clears throat> the 
One should always know the form of the tune they're playing on. Um, this helps you com compartmentalize ideas. And, and knowing uh, <clears throat> what the form is, that can help uh, inform your improvisational choices because forms imply direction. They imply uh, momentum, harmonic momentum, and melodic momentum. Um, if you have an A, A, B, A song form, the end of the second A is always going to lead into the B. And what does the B do? It provides momentum and a variation from the A's and leads back into the A, harmonically and melodically. It has some, uh, <clears throat> just like we, we analyze classical tunes that have, you know, the, the five leading to one, that's our internal harmony, that's our main pool. Um, so there's ways to divert from that and come back to it, and form can really um, help us understand that. And if we have a, a clear understanding of the form of tunes that we're improvising on, we can uh, develop our solos and improvisation in the same way. A lot of times, today especially, there's uh, people go through jazz studies programs and they learn all their 251 licks. But a 251 lick going into the B section inherently should sound different than a 251 going to the one chord at the beginning of the top of the form, right? So there's a lot of plug and play and learning to improvise today, which I think this, thinking in this way, can help to alleviate that, that problem that we see a lot of times. It helps you develop, have more fun, and develop a more uh, interesting solo. Um, so one way to really get confident with form, especially on this, the genres of tunes that we're talking about, uh, and the time period that these tunes come from is by listening to uh, vocal versions of them. Learn the lyrics, sing along with it, just like <clears throat> become familiar with it where it's uh, innate in you, just like there's, I'm sure there's music that you listen to in your headphones or if you drive or whatever that you can sing along with. The reason you can sing along with it is because you've listened to it enough that it's ingrained in you and it's, uh, <clears throat> you can just recall without much effort. And if you listen to uh, vocal versions of the tunes, it can also, even the, even the lyrics can give you an idea of where the harmonic momentum and where things tend to pull. Um, and I have an example here that we'll probably all recognize, hopefully, that um, it starts on the one chord, and then it's one long sentence, compound sentence, and when the sentence is over, it ends back on the one chord and goes through some different cycles, uh, mainly in fourths, between the beginning and the end. So. Someday, when I'm off the old, when the world is cold, of that, that A section of that tune, the way we look tonight, uh, it begins with a statement and moves through, and if you shape your and resolve back at the end of the uh, lyrical sentence, if you have that melody in your, in your ear as you're improvising, that can help you give a direction. There's a lot of two fives that go on in there. Three six, and then it goes to the uh, other places before it resolves back to the home key. So if you're developing you know, it wouldn't have as much direction and clarity if you just do, okay, this is a 2 5, I'm going to do a little bit here, and then, oh, I know this lick that goes with this key right here. If you direct, think of the entire form and the shape of that A section as leading from a one chord to another one chord. Um, and these, these are things that are heard by um, most ears more naturally than if you play a bunch of really cool licks. If you have direction and shape in an improvised solo, the common layman is not familiar with all the uh, jazz terminology and, uh, you know, the, that they'll innately enjoy that more because it it's fits within the structure of the song and it has a greater arc to it. Um, aside from the 12-bar blues and rhythm changes, the most common forms uh, of these tunes are A, A, B, A, and A, B, A, C. Any questions so far? No? 
Okay, so the melody, just like we were saying, let's all, uh, let's say, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Okay, now let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Right, we can start on ending up. Right, and, and we have the, the oral idea of how that melody goes. Well, the idea is once you listen to these tunes and you can sing along with them, the melodies in your head, you should be able to start them on your instrument on any note, and inevitably more certain, if you're a melodic instrument, certain keys are more natural than others, so you might fumble in the more difficult keys. But you'll hear that you fumble, and it's just a matter of easy adjustment to get those melodies. You know, especially these, these melodies that are based on lyrics, and they should be fairly uh, not too advanced. Once you get into bebop heads and stuff, you might have to work a little bit harder, but I think just the process of doing this and playing being able to play a melody in any key, these simple melodies, uh, develops your ear by the second term of this mystical <laughs> uh, you know, chorus. Your, your ears will be developed enough to where it would be easier to tackle and be and something like that. <coughs> okay, so there's the, the matter of the chords. We've talked about form and melody. And this is where it gets interesting, uh, learning the chords to tunes. And what may seem a daunting task, if you're thinking, okay, this is a 2-5 to this, this is a 2-5 to this, and it strings along, there's a bunch of, we consider form um, and look at larger sections of harmonic progression. There are harmonic, common harmonic sequences of chord progression that occur in literally hundreds of these tunes. Sequences in whatever key, if you recognize and can analyze them uh, functionally, thinking in Roman numerals, um, then you'll start to recognize that these same sequences of chords literally happen over and over in all different, in uh, many of these tunes. And the key is to learn to hear these sequences, to where not just recognize and analyze them, but by uh, hearing them, then once you, if you're learning a new tune, and you're listening to a recording of it, you'll, once these are ingrained, you'll hear this progression, you'll say, oh, that's that. So you know the, the whole eight bars, if you can identify the certain uh, harmonic sequence that happens in tons of tunes. And if you notice at the, I'm going to present a series of harmonic progressions that are common, some of the most common. And if you look at the, the last three or four or five pages in your packet, there's lists of tunes that these harmonic progressions happen in, and specifically which bars they happen in. So the goal of this is if you're self-motivated, you can listen, say, OK, I'm going to really learn to hear this first progression, and listen to all of these examples, and start to hear it and internalize it orally. There's a, another packet of therapy. Okay, so does that make sense that there's basically what we're going to be doing is looking at the most common chord progressions, uh, sequences of chord progression, and we'll also talk about how you identify them orally. So the most common that happens in every tune are turnarounds. Uh, turnarounds are a way to smoothly connect the sections of forms, if you're in A, A, V, A, uh, the, the connection of those forms uh, happen through turnarounds. Um, it's important to note that the harmonic rhythm of turnarounds can vary in length from an entire measure to one beat per chord. Um, there's also some tunes where the entire, entire sections of the tune occur one big turnaround. If you think of the tune you know the A section to the tune, Happy Madness Jones. A section is just one big turnaround. <clears throat> one, six, two, five, three, six, two, five. That's the A section. Um, uh, so in A, A, B, A forms, the turnaround at the end of the first and last A sections, as well as at the end of the B section, so three out of the four, usually lead to the first chord of the tune while the turnaround at the end of the A section usually leads into the, of the second A section, usually 
is altered to lead to the harmonic center of the B section. <clears throat> in A, B, A, C tunes, the turnarounds usually occur at the end of the B and C sections, so leading back to the A section. Um, quality of chords and turnarounds can vary, major, minor. Uh, most often, they're the odd of the minor or dominant. Some diminished can happen there too. So the, we want to strive for hearing the root movement of these turnarounds. And really, there's, I could go into a long explanation of why you can play a minor scale on top of a dominant chord, and it sounds pretty cool because you're actually going to be playing the sharp nine, but that would be a, a, another class in itself. So what are the most common turnarounds? Three, five, one. Okay, can we extend that to four chords? Six, three, five, one. Okay, can we extend that to four chords? Three, six, two, five, one. Yeah, three, six, two, five, one, or what's what can we substitute for three? One, six, two, five, one. Right, one, six, two, five. Uh, so the one and the three are are variable, are interchangeable. And we'll talk about that in a second. So <clears throat> this sequence of chords up here, the first line, the first system, is your standard. Uh, all every all the examples in which are going to be in the key of C, just for congruity. Um, so the first, the first sequence is your standard one six two five one. So if you listen to the root movement, Thank you. 
is what I mentioned a minute ago, is that so the 1 and the 6 and the turnaround are interchangeable because if we look at, in the key of C, our 1 chord, we we'll build it up to a 9, C, E, G, B, D, then you have the E minor, the 3 chord, is essentially the same chord without a C. Right? So those are really uh, functionally interchangeable. Okay, the next one of the most, uh, next most common cycles or sequences of chords is cycles of dominant chords and fourths. Uh, and the, what this does functionally um, is it pushes the harmonic motion forward in a way that anytime we, we hear a dominant chord, Four minor 
rarely go to the flat seven dominant without going to a relative. Okay. okay, another common sequence is the one becomes the minor two to create this cyclical movement. Um, so, and this can all, all, often be used uh, to create melodic and harmonic sequences. Um, this is the bridge to Cherokee. So, you notice we have a 2 5 1. see that these these types of tunes influence later tunes. Invitation was written much later, but it uses this, this type of harmonic sequence. Um, so does that make sense everyone? Yeah.
stands out from our home key of C major the most? That chart. All right. We get our tritone in there. And so that's that's the defining sound for me. Is if I hear a tritone from the root of the chord or the root of the of the tune, the key of the tune, then that's usually functioning as a two seven, and it almost always leads then to. Um, the two minor, or it could go directly to the five. Um, so this is, if you notice at the at the end, the list of tunes that utilize this harmonic movement is uh, vast. It's not even those lists are not anywhere near comprehensive either. Okay, there's something known as the back door flat uh, flat seven to one. Um, in traditional theory, this progression can be named a minor playable cadence. Um, the reason for this is that the 2-5 leading up to C is, um, you should be, you call it, uh, borrowed from the minor key of C minor. They have 4 minor, flat 7, those chords are borrowed from the minor key. Um, but it also often happens going to a major chord. Um, so the sound for that is listening for the flat seven being dominant. So see if you recognize the sound. We're going to we're going to C major, so. Sequence of chords 
is substituting a diminished chord for dominant chords. And this happens a lot in gospel music, uh, older music. And if you ever happen to be on NBC at around 1 o'clock in the morning or about 5 minutes until 1 on a Saturday night, and they're doing a bunch of commercials on Saturday Night Live, and then before it comes back, you hear this. Fifth and sixth? 
My, no, in the six it went to four. Right. So, okay. second and fifth. Okay, let's figure out the third system. Don't build it out yet. Let's hear it first. This is interesting to you. you know, um, 
and use the, the list on the back um, to find just many examples of all of these devices and measures that they happen to. And once you, there's many others. Uh, these are some of the most common, and if you can learn to hear those in the process of learning tunes and building a repertoire, it should be um, much less of a daunting task than it might be as an illustrator.